Greetings, Bill Mobley for the Brain Channel. Happy to be with you today and to be with Jeff Harris. Dr. Jeff Harris is Distinguished Professor of Otolaryngology in the Department of Surgery and the head of the Division of Otolaryngology. Jeff, it's great to have you here. Wanted to have you tell us a bit about your background and about the work that you and your division do and also about the exciting research that's going on in, in your group. Happy to do so. Well, I've been here, I'm one of the senior seniors now. Uh, hard to believe that I've been here 38 years. Um, started in uh, 1979, having finished training in Boston at Harvard, and uh, came here with a PhD as well in immunology. Where I thought immunology was going to take me in my training has ended up being completely different, of course. Uh, what's interesting was when I finished my training in Boston, I came to San Diego as a head and neck surgeon, not as an ear doctor. And uh, right about that time, there was a professor at University of Iowa named Brian McCabe, who's a very well-known professor in those days, uh, who serendipitously came upon the idea that ear, ear diseases and some, some hearing loss might be autoimmune in origin. And he wrote a classic paper then that I read, and with my background in immunology, I said, well, that's an a area that I ought to be investigating. And so I set about doing some basic science research on whether the ear, like what was thought to be the brain, whether it was immunoprivileged. And it turns out that it isn't. And it turns out from the basic science studies that our laboratory did that the ear has a relatively robust immunological response, that there appears to be in the inner ear a uh, organ called the endolymphatic sac, which is what is thought to be responsible for fluid resorption. But it turns out that it's the lymph node of the inner ear. And we did studies to look and see whether or not that organ, if disconnected from the ear surgically in experiments that we were doing, might it pre uh, prevent the ear from responding immunologically, and in fact it did. Hmm. So we developed this uh, new area of research and scientific investigation that uh, involved the inner ear immune responses. It turns out that patients also have conditions that uh, are immunologic, rheumatologic, viral, that provoke the immune response and affect their hearing. And so over the years, we've developed um, uh, methods of trying to diagnose them, including an antibody test I developed, and also ways in which we can begin to give them better therapies. As you know, with many rheumatologic diseases, you have to treat them with high-dose steroids. Uh, steroids have a lot of systemic side effects, and so we began to look at could you develop a treatment where you would be injecting these, in, these uh, drugs directly through the eardrum and get absorbed into the inner ear. It turns out that if you take uh, drugs that are off the shelf and inject them through the eardrum and have the patient lay on their side and try to have that drug absorbed into the inner ear, what happens is as soon as they swallow, it goes down the eustachian tube and the drug dissipates. Or as soon as they stand up, it comes out through the hole that you use to inject the drug in the ear. So I had the, uh, the good fortune to run into a venture capitalist in San Diego who uh, had an inner ear problem and we talked about a new therapy for his condition whereby we would inject a drug into his ear. So he underwent the treatment f that I did and in fact it, it helped him tremendously. Mm -hmm. And he came back and he said to me, well, you know, that's a great idea. Why don't we sit down and think about how we can develop a company that might be able to develop these kinds of uh, treatments and, and drug delivery that would be much more satisfactory to help patients. So it turns out that uh, with a lot of preclinical research that uh, he and his uh, people that were hired to investigate this uh, and our own expertise and help and guide them as to how to do this, we developed a, a sustained release chemical, uh, a gel that is uh, thermoreversible, meaning that if it's in the, uh, out here, it's in a liquid form but as soon as it hits body temperature, it gels. Hmm. So we can then embed into this uh, gel a drug such as dexamethasone, uh, and have it as a liquid form, inject it into the ear, and then as soon as it hits the body's temperature, it forms a gel and stays there for several weeks. Hmm. 
And so we've now developed a company in, around this idea. It's called Autonomy in here in San Diego. It's a now a company that has 160 employees. And uh, it, it now has a uh, antibiotic that we have uh, suspended in this gel that allows children to get one injection through a tympanostomy tube, those little tubes that you use for uh, fluid that builds up in the middle ear of kids. <clears throat> Uh, and they don't have to use eardrops. And so this is an antibiotic that will stay around for two weeks. And uh, they don't, the, the parents don't have to put drops in their ears. There's no screaming. It's just a sustained release uh, drug. And it's now FDA approved and it's being commercialized today. So an example really of having a basic interest in science, but also a, a job that brings you to the, to the care of patients and you put those two things together and some pretty surprising things can emerge. Yeah, so I guess that's what's translational research, you know, in the true sense of the word. Jeff, you've been involved in a number of projects. Uh, the cochlear implant is an interesting, really interesting, not just from a therapeutic perspective, but interesting in the terms of the way the brain interprets the information coming from the implant. Speak a little bit about that, if you will. Yeah, it's, it's a miracle, really. Uh, I can't think of anything that is equivalent to it that we currently have. I mean, there are a lot of things happening in the eye, but there's nothing as advanced as cochlear implants for patients that are deaf. Mm. And um, I did the first cochlear implant in San Diego in 1985. Uh, it was in those days um, a very crude device, an electrode that you would put surgically into the inner ear with the notion that these electrodes would lay up against the neurons that were still surviving within the inner ear of a deaf patient. Because as you know, uh, hearing is uh, uh, conductive, the eardrum, the ear canal, the little bones, and that takes uh, sound into the inner ear. That stimulates hair cells. The hair cells are what uh, create an electrical impulse, and that gets transmitted through the neurons to the brain. And in many deaf patients, the hair cells go, but the neurons survive, or a portion of the neurons survive. So, and because the cochlea is a snail shell in terms of its anatomy and the way it's designed, um, it, it's a perfect uh, anatomical configuration to allow an electrode to lay up against a uh, n surviving neuron at a specific frequency. And so these current devices have 22 to 24 electrodes. Each one lays against the uh, center of the cochlea and it stimulates a neuron with a specific frequency that it's capable of um, receiving. And at that point, the brain will pick up what is now a different way of hearing and um, be able to interpret that as sound, and in, case, in some cases music, and in some cases um, everything in their environment. It's, it's absolutely fascinating that you see a uh, individual who has been deaf for many years and uh, was once a hearing person, and you turn this device on and within a few weeks, mm -hmm. they, even immediately, they'll say, I got back into my car and I couldn't believe what, what was the sound I was hearing, and it was the turn signal that they were hearing for the first time in 15 years. So it's a device that works uh, beautifully well in people who are deafened, and uh, now the indications have been extended to people not only who have bilateral profound deafness, but who can still hear with a hearing aid. And you're able to implant an electrode that pr uh, augments the high frequencies and they have preserved low frequencies so they can wear a hearing aid and the, and the device itself. So it, it gives them a full range of uh, uh, fidelity that they would not get in, uh, previously. You know, uh, it's, it's very clear that uh, <clears throat> the brain learns how to listen to the implants. It, it learns how to listen to all kinds of other information coming in orally that are, it's pretty indistinct, but you teach it a little bit and it learns a lot. What do we know about how the brain changes in people with a cochlear implant. Do we know how the brain circuits are modified? Is there some in insight into that? There are uh, places that are doing uh, functional MRIs with people who have been implanted and have looked to see whether or not there are certain areas of the brain that have taken over. Uh, and what's interesting is that you can take an electrode that should be only for the um, high frequencies. 
and it doesn't reach into the areas of the low frequencies. Uh, and yet, once the patient gets uh, the ability to listen and learn, and the, the, it'll fill in these areas, and they will actually be getting low frequencies where the electrode should be laying up against a mid or a high frequency fiber. And so there's some plasticity that occurs and allows there to be a shift in the tonotopic organization of the brain to you know, reinterpret what they're hearing as higher frequencies or lower frequencies. It's great stuff. It's really so fascinating. I mean, <clears throat> this is the brain channel, so we're obviously extremely excited about the brain. And, and I think we've just scratched the surface in understanding how it takes in sensory information. Talk about the near future for your own work and for the work of the division. What, what are the projects you have in mind? Well, otolaryngology is a big field. It's, uh, we think of ear, nose, and throat, but in fact, we do head, neck cancer. We, t we take care of all of the uh, serious cancers that develop in the oropharyngeal areas, the larynx, um, the face, uh, and in deep to the face. We do skull-based surgery, which is sort of a no man's land between uh, the inner ear and the neurosurgical uh, uh, parts of the skull. Um, and right now what's really become fascinating is the, uh, uh, the epidemic of HPV as a cause for oropharyngeal cancer. Uh, it's become very well recognized that HPV affects people who are not the smokers and the drinkers. And so we have a whole cadre of people who have developed oropharyngeal cancers that are due to a you know, human papilloma virus. And so the treatments that we can now afford them and the surveillance that we now have to do has changed immensely in the last five years. Mm -hmm. And so there's gonna be an onslaught of more patients who come through with HPV-related cancers. And you guys are developing the special abilities necessary to be the expert site for evaluating and caring for those patients. We, one of our faculty is, in fact, working on a spit test that would allow us to do uh, rapid screening of people who may or may not be at risk for Very HPV interesting. cancers. Very interesting. Jeff, the work's exciting, interesting. Uh, it's hard to believe that otolaryngology is, uh, is, is going to go out of style. One of, the, one of the major challenges that I think will face us after we've dealt with these degenerative diseases of the brain and after we've dealt with stroke, I think, of course, we're going we're gonna to have better ability to manage all that, maybe even prevent it. We're still going to have old folks that have trouble hearing and seeing. And my guess is that hearing is going to be just as much, just as important as seeing for those folks that are in their 90s or you know beyond 100. Any thoughts about what that looks like? What are we going to have available for those folks as they age? Well, it's interesting because greater than 50 percent of people over 75 are have hard are hard of hearing and have difficulty. And uh, between the ages of 64 and 70. 75, there are about a third of people who have significant hearing loss. So we're, we're all looking for ways to regenerate hair cells, find growth factors, neuro, neuro growth factors uh, that will stimulate the regrowth, not of just the hair cells, but of neurons as well. And what we're finding is that um, the supporting cells that lay underneath the hair cells can um, regenerate hair cells. So with the proper stimulation, they can be turned from just supporting cells to new hair cells. And in uh, lower uh, species, this happens all the time. Mm. In chickens, for instance, if you wipe out their hair cells, uh, they will regrow new hair cells. And there are some mammals that we're beginning to tease apart the signals that prevent them from regenerating so that their hair cells can regenerate. And it's only a matter of time, we hope, that we will be having drug delivery, like I mentioned earlier, for growth factors that can be put into a person's middle ear, get absorbed into the inner ear, and within uh, you know, months, their hair cells start sprouting, so to speak. And that would be the greatest way we can regenerate uh, hair cells and in people who are beginning to lose their hair cells as they age. Uh, one of the important things, of course, is the prevention of uh, hearing loss. And uh, many people uh, create their own problem by noise exposure. And we know that that's a big factor for the development of uh, uh, 
progressive deafness in patients and people who you, you see every day out there on the streets, they're workers, they're construction people, and they're in uh, there with the jackhammers and they don't wear hearing protection or they're carpenters or working in shops where they you know, don't protect themselves. And all they have to do is wear some ear protection and they will prevent not only hearing loss, but the other thing that's so plaguing of people is tinnitus, the ringing part of the uh, symptomatology that goes along with deafness. Jeff, great to talk with you, great to hear about all the advances, and uh, here's looking forward to a great future in which all of us are able to hear a little bit better. Yes, I hope so, me too. Good. Thank you. Bill Mobley for The Brain Channel.